I'm going to tell you a little bit more about monogamy and specifically looking at social relationships in rodents. So over the last few decades, we've actually learned a lot about the genetics and uh, neurocircuitry underlying social behavior, and especially monogamy. Um, but we still have a lot more to learn, and um, I'm going to tell you about the development of uh, a new animal model to look at some of these behaviors. So um, first, talking about human genetic monogamy, sorry, human monogamy and the genetics underlying that can be a little bit tricky. And one reason for that is that it can be difficult to define and definitively place humans on this spectrum of social behavior. So most people agree that humans tend toward the monogamous end of this spectrum. Um, but there, even at that end of the spectrum, there are differences that are important to note between social monogamy and sexual monogamy. So social monogamy is when two individuals form a pair bond. They spend most of their time together. They might even be aggressive toward others as a way of uh, defending their pair bond and maintaining that bond. But this does not necessarily correspond with sexual monogamy, which is, of course, exclusive mating. So there's a lot of uh, debate about where humans lie here, but most experts agree that humans are either socially monogamous, but not necessarily sexually monogamous, or serially, socially, and sexually monogamous. I'm sure you've all heard the terms serial monogamy before. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. <laughs> Um, so, it can be hard to disentangle the sociocultural and other environmental influences that affect human behavior and when we want to get at the genetic basis of behavior. So, to really get at the heart of the genetic root of these behaviors, we turn to animal models. So, I'm going to advance this here. There we go. Uh, arguably, the favorite mammal model of monogamy is the prairie vole. These animals are rodents that are socially monogamous. So the male and female form a pair bond. They spend most of their time together. They may show some of that aggression that I mentioned toward other individuals to maintain their own pair bond. And the male and female both participate in rearing their offspring which is pretty cool. And so um, th we can compare prairie voles to other closely related vole species that may be monogamous or non-monogamous, and by doing this, um, determine what differences occur in these different species that can contribute to their different social mating strategies. So uh, a couple of the molecules that have been implicated in these behaviors are oxytocin and vasopressin, which Dessa mentioned. Um, and they are critical for the formation of these uh, pair bonds between male and female prairie voles. So my particular interest is in addiction and the important role that social relationships play in influencing drug and alcohol intake at um, all stages of abuse of drugs and alcohol. So uh, to, it turns out that these prairie voles, in addition to being great models of social behavior, are actually pretty heavy drinkers when I give them the opportunity in the lab. <laughs> so we g usually give them basically pure alcohol d diluted in water to about the concentration that you find in beer or wine, so usually six or 10% alcohol. And they seem to really like it. They show, <laughs> it sounds pretty gross to us, just pure alcohol and water, but they uh, show a high preference for drinking this solution over water, and they drink a lot of it. So if you compare the dose that the voles drink in a typical day, uh, and adjust that for their body weight and metabolism, it would be like me drinking about two bottles of wine in a day, which is really a lot more than I can actually handle. Maybe two glasses, maybe. So they actually do reach intoxication, 
And um, so they make a great model for looking at how these um, drinking behaviors can interact with their, these strong social bonds that they form. Uh, so here's a picture of them <laughs> drinking. So to begin to investigate how social interactions uh, affect alcohol drinking, I first asked whether voles would drink differently depending on their social environment. So it turns out that they actually do drink more when they're housed in pairs like this than when they're in isolation. Not only that, but they actually match each other's alcohol intake. <laughs> so this is like social facilitation of alcohol drinking that we see in different contexts. So at any party, um, on college campuses, maybe here tonight you will be doing some of that with your friends. Um, so this is a great model of a particular aspect of human drinking. Interestingly, this effect of uh, social influences on alcohol drinking is particular to same-sex peer relationships. So male-female pairs did not influence each other's alcohol drinking. And there's some support that this is true in humans as well. So think about if you were going out drinking and matching someone shot for shot, is that person more likely to be your buddy or your spouse? Right, so <laughs> I wanted to look more at this male-female bond though, and in particular see how alcohol would affect the development of that bond. So um, I paired males and females and gave half of them access to alcohol and then tested the strength of their bond in what we call a partner preference test. So in this example, the male is the test subject. So his partner female that he's been paired with is tethered to one end of this three-chambered cage, so she's restricted to that area. And then a stranger female he's never met is tethered to the opposite end of the cage. And we place the male in the middle and just ask him where he wants to spend his time. <laughs> Specifically, what we look at is this species-specific behavior called huddling, which is where the voles are in side-by-side, -side, motionless contact. Basically, it's vole cuddling. <laughs> so normally, after this 24-hour period of cohabitation, the male vole will show a strong preference for spending more time huddling with the partner and will spend very little time huddling with the stranger. So I'll let you think for a second about how that might change when they had alcohol. <laughs> and it might not surprise you to know that the male did not show this preference for the partner after they had had alcohol during their cohabitation period. They showed no preference whatsoever. <laughs> and this was not true for the females. If anything, the females showed the opposite effect, where they had a slightly higher preference for their partner if they had alcohol. So, does that make you think twice about having a drink on your first date? I think it should. <laughs> so, the, this models two different aspects of human behavior. The so social lubrication properties of alcohol that can help us enhance bonds, and also the detrimental effects that alcohol can have on bonds. For example, it is a causal risk factor for divorce. So altogether, these studies have shown us that these interactions between social relationships and alcohol drinking that we know are so important in humans uh, I really have this biological basis, and so now we can model this in prairie voles, and that allows us to look further into the genetics that underlie these behaviors and the neurobiology that can explain the behaviors as well. So I'm really excited about this research. I hope I've given you enough insight that you're excited too, and we'll be able to um, talk more about it, and uh, you can ask questions in a little bit. Thanks.